Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, and thank you for joining us here on Living Divine Mercy. Today is September the 11th, definitely a day of sorrow, as we remember those who gave their lives on this date back in 2001. May they rest in peace. But September is also the month of Our Lady of Sorrows, fittingly, or Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows. This title focuses on Mary's intense suffering during the passion of her son, Jesus. It is most often depicted by seven swords that pierced her heart, showing her spiritual martyrdom. Our Lady of Sorrows is one of the few Orthodox icons of the Theotokos, which does not depict her with the infant Jesus. So why is this, and why has it become one of the most popular of all Marian feasts in the church? We are The devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows was started by the Servite Order in 1668 and formalized by Pius VII in 1814. The feast is celebrated every September 15th, so this week, a day after the exaltation of the cross, which makes sense as Mary was saddened at the cross of Christ. And it completes the octave of the birthday of Mary on September 8th, which was eight days earlier. The seven sorrows of this devotion should not be confused with the five sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. Now, it may seem strange to think of Our Lady as Our Lady of Sorrows. After all, she's in heaven. Uh, she's the most blessed of all women, the greatest of all creatures, eternally beloved by God. So how is she Our Lady of Sorrows? Well, she joined her son in his self-sacrifice and sufferings here on earth, an example of persevering through the greatest of trials and tribulations. As Catholics, we are often told to offer it up in the midst of suffering. But that's not easy. Now, Our Lady of Sorrow shows us how because she certainly had plenty to offer to God in the midst of suffering. Thus, we have the seven sorrows of Mary. They are, first, the prophecy of Simeon. Second, the flight into Egypt. Then, the loss of the child Jesus for three days. Fourth, Mary meets Jesus carrying his cross on the way to Calvary. Fifth, the crucifixion of Jesus. Sixth, Mary's receiving the body of Jesus into her arms. And finally, seven, Jesus is placed in the tomb. So the swords in her heart indicate that Mary will have a share in her son's sufferings. Our Lord suffered for our sins, and it is those sins which forged the sword of Mary's pain. So we have a duty to atone not only to God, but also to his mother Mary, who is our mother as well. That is why we make reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus on First Fridays and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary on First Saturdays. But before that, Our Lady here reminds us of the tremendous evil of sin. But as co-redemptrix, now remember, co in Latin is cum, which means with and not equal to, Mary's tears help to wash away the sins of the world. We should note that her suffering was not one of sadness or despair. It was a suffering of love. When we love our Blessed Mother and her son Jesus, we will always grieve over sin. From the sorrows of Mary, we see that all sorrow is the effect of sin. The first tears ever shed by mankind were when he realized what was lost by sin. And every tear that has fallen since then has its origin in sin. Yes, Mary had no sin, which was the topic of an earlier show, but sin caused the death of her son, so sin made her weep. Our Lady, then, had many sorrows on earth, but surprisingly, she continues to have many sorrows today. 
She is laboring in heaven to give birth to the mystical body of Christ, to bring into new and eternal life all souls, or as many souls as will heed her son and follow him. Where she labored to give birth to Jesus, divine mercy incarnate, but had no pain, now to bring to life the whole church throughout time and history, she labors in pain. This is explained in Revelation 12. She sorrows with the church and rejoices with the church. She visits us with comfort at Guadalupe, in tears at La Salette, quietly at Lourdes, with signs and wonders at Fatima, and with a warning of sorrows to come at Cabejo. In fact, it was the visions of coming violence and slaughter that she shared with the children at Cabejo before the genocide in Rwanda that helped convince the church that Our Lady had truly visited Cabejo in Africa. Now, we Marian fathers have a particular connection to Our Lady of Sorrows through our work of mercy in Cabejo, Rwanda the site of Our Lady's apparitions in the 1980s to several children, as we mentioned. She asked them to tell people to recommit to the Seven Sorrows Rosary. This is a traditional devotion that's been forgotten or neglected throughout much of the church. She promised one of the Cabejo visionaries, if you say the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows and meditate on it well, you will find the strength you need to repent of your sins and convert your heart. Pray my seven sorrows to find repentance. The Rosary of the Seven Sorrows, also known as the Chaplet of the Seven Sorrows, has long-standing roots in the church's devotional life. As you pray the prayers, you meditate on those seven specific sorrows of Our Lady that we just gave. It's a specially appropriate devotion for times of penance, like Lent or Advent, because of Our Lady's promise to share with us the graces we need to repent of our sins and convert our hearts. God wants to save us all. He wants us to come home to heaven. But in justice, His mercy can be given only to those who are willing to accept it. His mercy reaches its full force and effect only where it is welcomed. And in order to welcome his mercy, we need to participate in the sacramental order he established through the church. We have to have conversion, to repent, to turn to him again and be saved. And that means getting baptized and confirmed, going to confession and receiving Holy Communion in the state of grace. That means cooperating with Christ and his church, the one he established, to make our hearts immaculate and keeping them clean through a sacramental life. So the graces promised through the Seven Sorrows Rosary are an important companion to the graces promised through divine mercy. Divine mercy offers us a pathway home to Christ and his church. And the sacraments offer us real grace, but the fruits of those sacraments depend on our cooperation with that grace. The Seven Sorrows Rosary offers us a great way to really work grace into our lives and our hearts, to reform ourselves according to goodness and truth. So this September, Pray the Seven Sorrows, a special rosary comprised of seven decades containing seven beads, each where you pray one Our Father and seven Hail Marys. And at the end of the show, we will show you how to get one of these rosaries. Make it a regular part of your prayer life and see how your life can change. See how the sacraments and your other devotions can become more fruitful. Together, the seven sorrows of Our Lady and the graces of the Divine Mercy Chaplet work powerfully for conversion and sanctification of yourself and your family. As for the Chaplet of Seven Sorrows, it reminds us that Mary plays a key role in our redemption and that she suffered along with her son Jesus to save us. So give it a try and see how your suffering, united with that of Jesus and Mary, can become redemptive. Now, speaking of sorrows, let's hear the story of Daniel Hidalgo, who struggled with sin in his life, but then found through the sorrow of the cross, redemption. Daniel 
two to five years, that's what people give me to live. That's what they say. I have ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I believe in heaven, I believe in hell. I want to get to heaven. My goal is to get to heaven. My name is Daniel Hidalgo. I'm from East Chicago, Indiana. I was raised in North Hammond. My father, my mom came from Mexico. There's seven people in my siblings. We were raised Catholics. We went to church every single day. Seven days a week, I can recall us going to six o'clock mass. So we were very religious. Everybody thought we were angels, which used to bother me. I had this image of being a tough guy. A lot of times I said ridiculous stuff, joking around, cutting down people, making fun of people. My mother had us say the rosary every single day. And so I knew all about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary was always on my side, even was sitting in jail, which was more than once for stupid things, you know. But never once did I doubt my faith. Went to Hammond High School, met my bride, Brenda Hidalgo. We met her on a blind date, and for the next couple of years, we were inseparable. Later on, I got married 13 days before I went to Vietnam. I was drafted May of 1968. I was in a helicopter ambulance, 571st dust stop. I volunteered to be a patient protector. I was flying in a helicopter ambulance and rescuing people. A famous battle called Hamburger Hill. We were rescuing 14 wounded soldiers and stayed there for a year. And I was lucky, I returned home. Over 50,000 guys my age died in Vietnam. It was a war of politicians. Later on, when I was working overtime, it was in the parking lot at Inland Steel. I'm reading magazines. Usually I was looking at dirty magazines, but this time I'm reading a magazine. It was nothing dirty about it. All of a sudden, something was happening to my body, something pure and clean. And there was something that poured from my head all the way down to my feet. It was so pure, I was ashamed that it occurred to me because I was so unworthy. Afterwards, it made me cry. And for three days afterwards, I tried not to cuss. I tried not to be a wise guy. After the third day, I was back at my old self, cussing out people, calling people names. Now, all of a sudden, Danny's back, you know. And I tried to have it back. Sometimes I was listen to all my religious tapes of Bishop Sheen. But I try to get it back, never could. That was the best experience of my life. This occurred to me, Jesus is real, Holy Spirit's real, believe in it. I eventually ended up at a Vietnam vet reunion in Vegas. I had cramps in the back of my legs. I don't know why, for three days, I had them when I was walking. Yeah, from my ankle to my calf. Further investigation reveals that I have ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I got it from Agent Orange in Vietnam. Two to five years, that's what people give me to live. That's what they say. Jesus gives us all tailor-made crosses. Crosses that'll get you to heaven. In my case, it's ALS. It was a tailor-made cross. 
for a guy like me because I'm a wise guy. I'm gonna lose my ability to speak. As I always say, dirty things or foul things. I can't sit with my hands anymore. So God's has given me this tailor-made cross to get me to heaven. That's what I believe. And uh, I'm thankful that, uh, I'm thankful that he did that. Brenda's a real strong Catholic. She is sometimes stronger than I am. She always says the rosary. She starts it. Even when I forget, she remembers. The rosary is a powerful prayer. It's scripture. I've always believed in it, even though I was a little boy. And we do it faithfully. My faith means everything to me. I was born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. I believe in heaven, I believe in hell. I want to get to heaven. I may have to do some hard time in purgatory. My goal is to get to heaven. If I want to pass anything on, I want to say, believe in God, believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because that's gonna get you to heaven, nothing else will. As i not saying that other people won't make it to heaven, other people will. God will give you so much grace. It's what you do with the grace that God gives you that'll get you to heaven. My name is Daniel Hidalgo. I'm a Catholic, I'm a veteran, and I'm a servant for God. Wow, what a powerful story. And Daniel, may you rest in peace. And thank you to his son, Danny, for sharing that story with us. Now, let's hear on Meet a Marian from one of our seminarians, Brother Alex, as he tells us a little bit about his vocational story. I am a seminarian with the Marians. I profess vows in August, vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I'm going into my third year uh, with the Marians this year. And with professing vows, I there's, so there's poverty, there's chastity, there's obedience. What that basically means is, we well, I mean following Christ, just how he lived on earth. He was poor, he was chaste, and he was obedient to the Father. And in poverty, we just rely on him to give us everything, uh, not only economically, financially, uh, but also spiritually, knowing that it is through him that we live and there's no need to worry, knowing that he's gonna provide for us in every way. Um, so there's the aspect of being poor in fact and living simply. Uh, with chastity, it's giving up um, the sexual act for the kingdom, for God, knowing that he's gonna fill that in a way that no one else can. And it's a sign of what's to come, because in heaven there will be no marriage. And by the grace of God, I get to participate that in, with him and that here on earth. And with obedience, it is just submitting myself to God through what my uh, superiors say. If they say, go do this, then I say, okay. And if they say, go do that, then I say, okay. And just knowing that whatever is told of me through those above me is what God has for me and trusting in that completely.
I'm just so like unworthy and it's not about me at all. Like my story is, it's a testament to what he, he has done and what he's doing and I'm just a recipient. Um, and if he wants to use that to like bring people to him, then like incredible. But like, it's not about me, it's all about him. And, but I do think about that because I'm at a pl I'm 22. I'm at a place in my life where, God willing, I persevere until the end in religious life and to the priesthood. The majority of my life will be in service of Christ and in relationship, in authentic relationship with Him. And so I've always kind of just used the example if for whatever reason, God allows me to um, make it to 95 years old, which I hope He doesn't. Like, take me earlier, I'm ready, you know. But um, if He gets me to 95, I would have been like a religious for like over 70 years. So pray, go to the Blessed Sacrament. I think it's important for people to know that God isn't gonna waste your time. And so if you feel called to the priesthood, if you feel called to religious life, like God isn't gonna play with your feelings. If if you go somewhere authentically seeking him, like Lord, this is what I, what I feel like you're calling me to, then he's gonna respect that and he's gonna respect your time because you're giving it back to him. And so he's not gonna do this little like game right like oh go over here go over there like he's gonna he's gonna respect that and so and then i think i mean most importantly is just like jump it's a leap of faith like we never know with certainty uh, you know after a certain point you do have a sense of certainty but maybe at the beginning you don't and maybe there's so much stuff that you feel like i have to give up oh it's worth it it's worth every second it's worth everything like just take the leap like you don't know where you're gonna land but that's what he's asking of you. And you'll be surprised to see that the landing pad is a lot better than what you might have expected. I've experienced it firsthand. And so I'm eternally grateful. And I think with Divine Mercy, it's, you know, he's a person, right? It's, it's not this idea, it's not this conception. And maybe that fits into it, you know, somewhere later, but it's Jesus. It's a person. It's someone that wants relationship with me first and then calls me back to him and gives me his mercy in order to be able to follow him more fully. And just in experiencing him in that way, uh, I love it. I love him. And it leads me to want to be able to share that with other people too and bring him to other people. and help other people have a, a real personal relationship with, with the person of Jesus Christ and experience that mercy. Well, thank you, Brother Alex. Now let's turn to Brother Ruben as he tells us a little bit about the incredible experience you've probably heard about at the Eucharistic Congress in Indiana. It was amazing. All I can say it was amazing. 60,000 pilgrims and everybody had something in common. We were all there to embrace each other and to feel the love of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Many times I have been told when I go to retreats that we're on this mountain of heights with God, but then when we come down it, we have to be witnesses and hold on to what we have been taught. You know, I thought about Faustina's um, quote, she mentions, the most solemn moment of my life is the moment when I receive Holy Communion. I long for each Holy Communion, and for every Holy Communion, I give thanks to the Most Holy Trinity. If the angels were capable of envy, they would envy us for two things. One is receiving Holy Communion, and the second is for suffering. Remember, we will find strength in the Eucharist. We receive from Christ what we give to him. He in return purifies our soul. For God wants to elevate us to the supernatural order to nourish our souls of his giving. Christ is truly present in the Mass, in the Eucharist, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Let us recall the Eucharistic discourse of Jesus when he speaks to his disciples. Now, he's not speaking figuratively, he's speaking literally. Let us listen to what the Gospel of John says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Those are the words of our Lord. It can't get any more clear than that. And so the Eucharist continues to be the source and summit of the spiritual life of the church. Let us remember to take this opportunity to be mindful and say yes to our Lord, no matter what the circumstances are. It is our faith that moves us. It is our hope for the eternal. And it is the love that comforts us and sustains us in the Eucharist. May God bless you. Y que viva Cristo Rey. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week about Our Lady of Sorrows. And as we talked about, praying the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows is a powerful devotion. And there on your screen is where you can get a pamphlet explaining how to pray it and the Rosary to Our Lady of Sorrows itself. So grab one for yourself for those that you love. And please join us next week because Father Thaddeus will be with us to talk about how to form your conscience. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>